Chris, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. So happy to have you with us. Thanks for being yeah. here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. cool because uh, your your uh, your film festival guide was like my bible uh, back in the days of my first movie. I totally wore it out. Had like notes written all over it. Uh, so it's it's cool to uh, to connect with you. Oh man, well thank you for that. Uh, all right, now I'm like really embarrassed and uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> but thank you. Yes, no, I I doesn't tell you anything about making movies, but how to take your movie on the festival circuit. So. I appreciate that it helped you out. Now, did I? How do I pronounce your name correctly? And my apologies, I should have gotten that before. Oh yeah, no one gets it right. It's Sievertson. 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 Yes. It should be obvious. Yeah, the, the S I is C in the Nordic languages. Also, S Y is C, like Max von Sydow. Oh, I love Max von Sydow. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, uh, but uh, first of all, thank you for joining us on the Film Threat Podcast today. Your movie is out today in theaters. Is that right? In limited release? Yeah. And is it video on demand also? Yeah, yeah. It's a day and date release from uh, Screen Media. So I think we're just in 10 cities. Um, awesome. I don't even know which ones uh, other than <laughs> LA and New York. Um, well, Chris, what led to this place? You said you used my festival guides. So obviously, you had a smaller indie movie that you took on the festival circuit. Your journey to get here to make a movie with Christina Ricci. And I have to say, she is stunning in this movie. I, I, I like she looks amazing in this film and it's also kind of a retro horror film in the sense yeah. that you know it's set in the 50s what led you to this place in terms of getting this project done and alan my colleague alan ing and i who's the editor-in-chief of filmthreat.com will be asking you questions and we're going to take questions from the chat so chat your best questions we're going to ask chris but tell us what led you to get to uh getting to make this movie yeah, well, uh, yeah. So, like the like I said, you know, my first movie was called uh, "The Lost." That's you know when I was diving into your guide. Uh, that you know we premiered that at South by Southwest back in two thousand six, um, and so since then, yeah, I've been working, you know, and uh, having various ups and downs, um, making indie movies, uh, and um, uh, you know this. The, you know, I I agree. Christina is just so amazing in the movie and this this was a script you know because i also i write a lot um and most of the stuff that i direct i usually at least have some hand in writing and this was a script that just came to me that was looking for a director and uh christina was already attached uh which was like you know amazing and then i read the script and i really you know i thought it was a great story i really clicked with it and just saw how my sensibility could work with it uh so then i just had to get the job which is you know i'm terrible at pitching myself uh, so I kind of just figured out like some semi articulate things to say uh, and just really kept at it and um, eventually got it, you know, and, and it was one of those scripts that had been around for a while and it almost got made with other directors here and there. Um, you know, there's there's so many projects like that that just take forever to get made. Um, but once I got on board, um, you know, we just kind of went full steam ahead and made it and it was kind of in the height of COVID, uh, which introduced a bunch of problems. but. Um, but yeah, we uh, we got through it, and and it was a, like a total dream to work with Christina. Um, like you said, she she looks amazing in it. She's like a true movie star in addition to being like a real actress, you know. And there's not not many uh, people like that. Uh, and she just like really uh, in, in in the '50s era, just like everything just like kind of popped when we had her uh, in our um, you know sets that we worked really hard to put together and everything in this period piece. Um, so yeah, so. That's kind of how it, it came together. And it's one of those like tonally, like uh, a, a slow burn at the beginning to the, the, this stuff happening with Christina Ricci's son, who's having issues at school and has, uh, I don't want to ruin too much, but like, to me, one of the most horrific scenes, which is having a birthday party and nobody shows up. Yeah. And I know, I know as weird yeah. as that sounds, it's just like, oh, that's, the, that happened to a friend of mine. And it's like, that's a scar for life, right? Oh, like yeah, totally. Having yeah. A, a kid's birthday party, no one shows up, horrifying. Uh, but but like, what I love is like, it's this small cast. It's like this, like, what is going on? I want to show a scene from the, a movie. The movie, would you, would you mind if we watched it real quick? Um, yeah, cool. I think we can bring it up on screen here. Uh, let's, let's watch the scene from Monstrous and then we'll talk about it on the, on the back end. 
Whoa. So uh, first of all, we, I, everyone's, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. We're going to get to the chat questions and comments. So get your questions ready for Chris right now. But you said Christina Ricci was already attached to the project when you came on board. When you met her, what was it like meeting her? She definitely has an aura about her. Um, you know, tell me what that was like and what your relationship, your working relationship was like uh, with her on the set and whatnot. It was great because she's uh, she's just like a really, uh, just a good person. And she's really funny. Um, she has a really good sense of humor uh, and doesn't, you know, tends not to like uh, take anything too seriously. Uh, which I really relate to. Um, so, uh, you know, the first time, yeah, I was kind of nervous, like first meeting her. And like I said, like, because uh, you know, normally in day to day, what I do is write. So I get like very in my own head. And then when I direct a movie, I have to like kind of come out of that and, you know, use like a different part of my personality and brain. Um, so I was kind of nervous when I was first talking to her. And I think I was like talking about like the script, like in intellectual terms. And she kind of made fun of what I was saying. And I thought it was hilarious. Uh, and then after that, we were just like, uh, just like instant friends, um, you know, because my friends are always making fun of me. Uh, and, you know, like, you know, like, I feel like, you know, that's a big part of how friends relate is just through humor. Um, so, so it was really great. And she's just like, you know, just has such skills. Uh, and, um, you know, it was anything I wanted, like any kind of like little adjustments. Um, she was just like really interested in exploring and um yeah yeah i mean she's worked with like so many so many great filmmakers and has been working you know she's also since she's been doing it you know since she was 10 years old every day pretty much like she has more experience than anyone on set um but uh you know is is very humble and just very sweet to everyone um so everyone kind of like had to like you know once once we had her it's you know uh you know everyone like has to like step up their game you know uh, you know, because we were a small movie and we had to create the these sets and these costumes and this look for the movie um, that was like worthy, you know, to like give her like a, a, a stage that was worthy of her to perform on, if that makes sense. Well, it's a good, it's also a good mix of like her acting against the effects. It's a good mix of like, obviously practical effects, there's practical effects with, with, with digital enhancement in places and that seemed to really serve the movie well. We've got a lot of love if you want some love in the chat and questions. So if you don't mind me going through uh, the, the chat questions here from our audience that's watching live. Okay. Uh, we'll go through. I don't know if you can see it. Flaccid Phoenix says, Chris Sievertson, greater than Chris Gore. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. Chris is a fine name, says Lawrence Gillespie. VDR <laughs> says, Wednesday Adams grew up, Ken Bogus, Christina Ricci is always stunning. Solomon Thornton says, love Christina Ricci and the Adams family. What is your inspiration? So what, what is your, what are, what are your inspirations? And people are going to be asking that in here. Um, well, for, for this, the inspirations for this film in particular, as opposed to kind of being inspired by other movies, it was a lot of, um, what I looked at was like a lot of 50s advertising, uh, both uh, like print ads, commercials, radio ads, catalogs all that kind of stuff because it was kind of like that that decade was kind of like the birth of like modern um advertising uh and like the way that uh you know advertising would try to present people um you know with the like an idealized way that they should live like you know you need these you need to wear this you need to drive this you need these things in your kitchen um you know, and there's, you know, there's like kind of a, we even got to use a, an original like hot point commercial in the movie. Uh, they made like refrigerators and dishwashers and stuff. Um, and it almost becomes like this haunting mantra uh, in the character's head. Um, the way that, you know, we're haunted by commercials all the time. Um, so really, yeah, the inspiration on this one was, and also a lot of old fifties photography. Um, you know, I have, I have a ton of like filmmaking influences, like I watch, you know, I've, uh, they're all, all often like in conflict with each other. Like I have so many filmmakers who I love that are wildly different. Um, so I'm not sure. Whoops, this fell out. My, my <laughs> AirPods always fall out. I don't know why other people don't have that problem, but I <laughs> do. Um, but, but yeah, so advertising was a big one, you know, uh, you know, like the, which makes, you know, like why, uh, like that stuff that like Mad Men was tapping into that, that birth of like, um, you know, 
American uh, advertising in the modern age. Yeah, I, I I love that stuff. And I love that the film like really sort of did the world building with like, this is the 50s. There's no Wi-Fi, no cell phones. There are some devices, right? Television. But it was so, it almost felt like there was one shot and I felt like she seems trapped with all this stuff. It had It had like a really good tone even before the monstrous stuff starts to happen. Uh, but we've also got some, just some great questions here. Um, comments, Courage 77. I love Christina Ricci. She's a good actress. Um, and then Rabadab 55, what are your monster movie inspirations that really drove your vision for the film? Well, I, one thing that I was super lucky to do in this was we actually got to create, at one point she's watching a monster movie on TV. Um, so we actually got to create our own monster movie, which of course, to me, the inspiration there is uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, but that was, I shot way more than we needed. You know, it's a pretty brief sequence where she's kind of falling asleep watching TV and there's this kind of old school creature feature on and then she becomes a part of it. Um, and I shot tons of stuff for this. It was like, it was a very like surreal experience um, to be shooting like with this old fashioned like monster in a suit. Uh, and Christina is in this like cool bathing suit and it was kind of dusk and it was like, it just, it felt very surreal. Um, but I realized that like, I would have been like totally happy making B movies in the fifties. Uh, Cause it was just so, so fun. It was, and it kind of perked up the whole crew too. It was like at the end, you know, towards the end of a really long day. Um, everything that happens at that lake was all one day. And the last part of the day was when we got to do the monster stuff, uh, the, the old school monster stuff. Um, but, but yeah, so definitely Creature from the Black Lagoon, um, you know, is uh, just so beautiful. You know, like there's that shot in, in that movie where the creature, the classic one where the creature is swimming underneath the, the woman who's swimming at the top and he's kind of shadowing her. Um, and it's just really beautiful. Uh, and also, you know, kind of like a love story, like the King Kong uh, Beauty and the Beast kind of thing going on there, too. Yeah, it has that aspect. I mean, Creature from the Black Lagoon what, might be one of my favorite 1950s like B monster movies because the monster is so convincing. I mean that whole costume. I mean it's basically a scuba suit, but it's yeah. so such a great and it's a trilogy. And I believe that actress is Julia Adams, and she's wearing this um one piece bathing suit that's stunning. That's all. I'll yeah, say. yeah. And those she, old bathing suits are so cool. Yeah, and that's yeah. right. I, I yeah, I I it's been a long time since I've seen the sequels. Yeah, um, but, but it was and a I trilogy. think the same director. Yeah, I think the same director did at least the second one too. And the first movie is like sixty minutes. It's not like not like a long yeah. movie. Um, more questions from our chat here. Bashy Washy says, "Thanks, Chris, for this. My question is: as a director of a movie, what do you think is, is the best way for us fans to support your project to be free from the Holly woke influence? A lot of the conversation around here, and almost everything that Alan and I review." A lot of people ask, well, is it is the movie kind of woke? Is it forcing some kind of agenda? I mean, I can just say having seen Monstrous, there is zero anything like that. Like it's it is a straight up, you know, haunting monster movie with deeper layers to it, so to speak. No pun intended. Um, but uh, and it's also a retro film. It's set in the 50s. There's nothing like that. But uh, look, the way you can support it is see the movie. It's on video on demand today. It's in theaters and limited release. Go see Monstrous and support it. But do you have any comments on that, Chris? Like, as a director, like, you you know, I mean, I think it was Quentin Tarantino who said, someone asked him, like, what's your favorite era to make movies in? You make movies in different time periods. And Quentin Tarantino said, any time before cell phones. He just likes movies yeah. kind of set in a different era. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Uh, well, this was actually my first period piece, uh, and I love doing it because, um, for one thing, just like from a practical level, it really forces forced everyone to work, you know, harder. Everything in the frame has to be there for a reason, you know. Uh, every location has to, you know, we have to take all this into account to create this period piece. Um, and it's fun to step outside of uh, modern day and uh just look at so yeah because we can get so caught up in whatever people are um debating about uh or arguing about in modern day but if you kind of step outside of that a little bit um and just try to find like universal themes like this movie deals with a lot of universal themes that i think are pretty easy to relate to you know like the parent-child relationship uh loss um you know even just simple things like you said uh like i'm glad you connected with the 
you know, uh, empathizing with this kid when no one shows up to his birthday, you know? And at one point, Laura's reading a magazine uh, that's like, and, she, and, the, and the, the title of the article is called How to Fit Into Any Occasion, um, you know? And it's like, she's trying to like fit into the society. So, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really just kind of more interested in kind of dealing with like universal themes. I feel like this movie is like, uh, I would describe it as like kind of like an emotional like fairy tale uh, like, as opposed to like, it's, it's not, and, and we, the way we tried to work on it was like not intellectualizing things, um, and just trying to keep things like very simple and elemental. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that worked, but, but like I said, I, I like just little things like, yeah, like that kid alone, uh, nobody shows up for his birthday party. Like that, like just breaks my heart. Um, and, uh, cause yeah, I don't know everyone, uh, and plus with on being online with, you know, uh, everyone is like, you know, I think, uh, secretly pretty sensitive, um, you know, online people try to like act like, uh, tough, but I think, you know, we're all affected by what everybody says to us, uh, whether we want to be or not. Um, so, so yeah, so it would, I, I definitely kind of like stepping outside of the modern day and making something, you know, in, in, uh, in the past. Well, we've got more comments here. People commenting on the clip that we just saw. Uh, not the Batman says her living room has a pool. Not fair. Um, used web cartridge says that was pretty sick. Evolution of gaming says that was pretty cool. Akinika says great clip. And then Josiah Teal has a question. Were, were there any Christina Ricci performances that made you extra excited to work with her? Any film, you know, scenes from other movies that made you, oh my God, I get to work with Christina Ricci. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of them. I mean, sleepy hollow. Is, is a favorite of mine that's just such a gorgeous like sumptuous uh period piece um and uh pecker the john waters movie uh yes. from the 90s with yes. uh, her and eddie furlong i oh. i really love that and um black snake moan uh i think is incredible um you know her and sam jackson where he's trying to like tame her sexual demons uh like that movie's incredible i don't think it would really get made now probably um but it's uh just a gorgeous movie um and buffalo 66 um yeah there's there's so many and obviously adam's family uh but, but yeah she's like all of those because i'm i'm just such a fan of those movies so like and then you know getting to meet her and work with her it was just like a total dream uh, more comments and questions here michael seager says julia adams mother of god Yes, Julia Adams from uh, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And then Mike Diver, 50s War of the Worlds might be the best sci-fi movie ever made. I love that era of filmmaking yeah. in the 50s. I mean, um, so many great, great science. I mean, it's really, I mean, you look at it now and it's obviously it's dated and, and whatnot, but it, it, you really see the the influences from back then to science fiction yeah. today. Um, Flaccid Phoenix asks, what scene was the most fun to shoot? I mean, there's underwater stuff. There's, you know, I mean, there's monster stuff. What was the most fun? I think the most fun overall was that monster movie within the monster movie that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because it was so, because when you have someone just sitting there in a suit that kind of looks ridiculous, it's kind of helps. It's just, you know, fun. You don't take yourself too seriously. A lot of the movie, I was like very stressed out, you know, because we're short on time, like all filmmakers are. Um, so a lot of it was very stressful. The pool uh, was was really cool. Under shooting underwater is almost kind of like cheating because everything you do looks just gorgeous. You know, if you just shoot slow motion underwater uh, and with the bubbles and what people's hair does and like the, the you can shoot shafts of light down there. Um, it just looks really, really gorgeous. And when I read that the clip that you showed, when I read that scene in the script. I assumed that we were, this was going to be a, you know, a big budget movie because she like falls through the floor. The only way I could do it was, you know, through a cut, you know, obviously just cutting to her falling into uh, a pool. Um, but we just shot in, in, that was just all shot in uh, a crew member's pool uh, that happened to have a weird, like there was, there was a shallow end and then a deep end with like a, a big, like a extreme drop off. So we were able to shoot from the shallow end into the deep end and it, it looked like this huge abyss. Um, but uh, but yeah, but but overall the, the monster stuff was, you know, just so fun to shoot. Akinika asks, who was on the costume design team? And I have to give you props for Christina Ricci's look through the whole thing. 
is definitely feels like a madman with the big poofy dress. Like, I mean, she, she really like sells it. Like she just looks oh, so yeah. perfect. Yeah. But can you talk about the costume design? Yeah. The costume design is uh, a really talented designer. Who I've worked with before Morgan DeGroff and she made most of that stuff by hand. Um, her budget was tiny. Um, but, and so she also, she found, uh, they used to sell in the fifties, these like, uh, these dress form packets that were like little, little packets, kind of like the size of a comic book. And you open it up and it's just like, um, like little pieces of paper that like you cut the fabric out to. So she found some of those old retro things and she used some of those as the basis for designing, um, some of these outfits, um, but that was a lot of fun, like going through and picking out the colors and trying to figure out which outfit was going to be right for which scene. Um, and then you just put them on Christina and it's just like she looks like she just stepped right out of the period, um, you know, because Christina has this kind of classic look about her that is even kind of similar to me to like a, a silent movie star, um, you know, like Clara Bow or something like with her big eyes uh, where the camera just loves her. Um, but uh but yeah the, the costumes were uh it turned out i um pretty amazing um so so i'm glad that that people are, are responding to that yeah it's i i don't think it, I, I think it's like impossible to take a bad picture of her she has these big eyes i mean christina Ricci almost looks like an anime character she's so like she just has this face that you know the, the camera loves her let's 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 just yeah. say that solid Jordan asks um i don't i'm not sure how much longer you can stay i know we talked about 20 minutes but um if you could stick around for a few more questions and we'll wrap it up sure. solomon thornton asks what is your process for making a horror film well what i think at the be yeah at the beginning i think it's like any film which is for trying to get like the hold of like the emotional core of it like what is it about from like the character standpoint um and and then like once that is, is in place then like how to use the horror uh to like torture the characters as much as possible these characters that hopefully the audience loves and then the horror comes in and you know you always want as many obstacles as possible for your characters to overcome um and then the the horror sequences like the suspense sequences um and that's always kind of daunting to me um you know uh but i think it's always like about trying to plan them out as much as possible uh you know like going back to like you know the master of suspense like hitchcock um, where everything was just like he would really plan out the suspense sequences uh, and trying to get uh, those those each each beat right. Um, and and that's like the tough thing on a on a low budget because suspense sequences, a lot of it is, you know, um, getting the proper all these different angles that you can kind of put together, um, you know. Uh, so so, yeah, so it's it's really just trying to, uh, you know, and, and people have seen so many horror movies now. Uh, you know, people are so used to uh, all the different like uh, tricks and cliches. So also trying to, you know, uh, use some of those, but then kind of sub subvert them, hopefully, and have, you know, surprise the audience, use their knowledge of what they expect against them sometimes. But it's, uh, it's really tough. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I really admire filmmakers who are able to create like um, suspense sequences, and I'm always studying them. Uh, usually just by turning, you know, wa watching sequences without the sound um, and then, you know, really trying to figure out like how they piece this stuff together. And then, you know, there, there's a lot to learn from from doing that. I, I do that all the time. Well, speaking of sound, Oteo asks, what was it like to do the music? A great score really makes a horror movie adds atmosphere. Yeah, I the the score, I'm really happy with both the score and the the 50 songs I was able to get in the movie. Um, which I didn't think was going to happen at, until the last minute. We finally were able to afford it. Um, but the composer I've worked with before, Tim Rotelli, uh, he's got a great band called Caliphone um, that's totally different than this kind of like uh, beautiful like horror movie music that he created for us. And again, we talked about um, like, you know, fairy tale kind of stuff because a lot of the music is like really beautiful um, and really kind of like hard on your sleeve, uh, emotional kind of stuff for this like mother son stuff um and so like one thing like in my writing like an early thing like that some some piece of advice someone told me was to that like helped me because I, I would always like try to be subtle was uh, not to be afraid to be cheesy 
uh, you know, just not to be afraid to like go for it, you know, go for like big emotions. Uh, and Tim is like kind of usually like a pretty subtle musician. So in this one, he really just kind of went for it and took some big emotional swings. Um, and I think it really turned out like really lush and, uh, and beautiful. So I'm super happy with that. Couple more questions, if you don't mind. Um, Fuzi asks, how much is light and color a role in your films? Man, I will say the poster might be one of my favorite indie film horror posters this year. In fact, we posted it on our film threat Instagram just because oh, nice. look how gorgeous. And, and obviously the, the poster, you know, is influenced from, you know, the movie, the photography in the movie. Can you tell us a little bit about how light and color played a role? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the color, um, I, you know, I'm just totally obsessed with color. Like I've always been obsessed with like the primary colors. They're just so visually pleasing to me. And in my earlier movies, uh, I used to be more like kind of like ana like uh, analytical, like ex assigning like certain meanings or whatever to certain colors. Uh, and I've kind of gone away from that and I've just kind of gone more like kind of like what feels right and what like feels like like uh, right at an emotional level. Um, and I agree, like the the poster, like the the color scheme of it is just you know, so pleasing to me. Um, so we went through, um, you know, and e e each kind of room uh, of our main sets had like a different sort of color scheme and each color scheme, you know, then then we would plan out what color Christina is going to be wearing, like what her, you know, her colors are and how that's going to relate to the colors of the set around her and how, what specific feeling that's going to give. And each one, like her bedroom, for instance, is this kind of like warm, pink cocoon like her one kind of safe place um and uh and then you put her in like these like this like nice yellow sweater that pops a little bit as a contrast against the pink and it just all kind of worked um and then yeah and then the light um you know it's uh had a, a great cinematographer senda bonet on this and um you know we uh we played a lot with uh um you know with haze like diffusing uh, the atmosphere in the room uh, to get like a kind of a nice, soft, like pleasing look. Um, and that kind of softens the light. Um, and then, you know, just playing with um, the contrast of like, you know, kind of bright, uh, cheerful colors with dark, heavy material um, was fun to do also. And then like the the uh, the lighting and, and the underwater stuff was kind of like just gritty um so so yeah like that's you know really it's it's there's so much with light and color uh to to play with um and uh yeah like luckily i had these great collaborators that were able to help you know bring all that to life some more uh comments here yes very hard to surprise audiences nowadays says the chicago box uh daniel says chris sounds like the type of director that made movies 50 years ago chicago box says i'll be giving this a watch and VDR asks a quick question. After surviving this, will you ever do a period piece again? I hope so, yeah. Because uh, because making anything is a challenge. Uh, and then just the period piece, I felt like I understood like why, you know, some a lot of directors make them so much. Um, because uh, it's just, yeah, like I said, just getting outside of modern day uh, is kind of a relief. Um, and it's kind of feels like there's an aspect to it, you know, cause there's always that when, when you make a movie and you bring all these people together, it's kind of like putting on a play or something. Uh, and then when it's a period piece, it just kind of heightens that more and everyone kind of comes together. It just kind of brings people together the, and by people. I mean, the crew that's making the movie together, um, uh, in even more so than I found than, than making a modern day thing. So. So yeah, so hopefully it'd be nice to have um, a little bit more money to do it next <laughs> I feel time like, though. <laughs> I feel like money is, uh, I mean, common sense would say money is the key to making a, a good period piece. Is that true or are there ways to do a period piece under on a budget, so to speak? It did, well, for one thing, I, I think it depends on the period. We were a little bit lucky with the 50s is a fairly popular period as far as like the prop houses and whatnot in Los Angeles. You know, there's like vast like Raiders of the Lost Ark sort of warehouses full of like archival material specifically for this period. And it feels like, uh, you know, the Mad Men running for a long time, really everyone had to stock up, you know, uh, on, on all their stuff. 
and also because in California, um, classic car collectors is like a big thing. You know, the weather is very conducive to cars staying in good shape. And those, those people like to show off their cars. Uh, so it's, you know, they don't need a lot of money to, in, for those 50 cars. I, I, we paid very little for the, these gorgeous automobiles that we have in the movie. And that's just because the guys that own them are proud of them, you know, and want them to be driven by Christina Ricci in a beautiful movie, you know, that, that'll they'll live on forever. <laughs> so I think for, for part of it, it's just depending on the period. But then there are certain, you know, you do have to spend money to, if you actually are going to create sets that are, are believable, um, you know, like in, in our, in the house, just, you know, getting the right furniture and the right, like linoleum flooring for the kitchen. That was like a big thing. Our production designer really kind of nailed that. And then just like these cool old refrigerators and everything. Um, so, so definitely uh, it was under budgeted at first and our production designer kind of like methodically broke down like how this had to work you know there is like a bare minimum that you have to have to spend um uh, we, pro- we probably spent like the bare minimum but um <laughs> pulled it off it looks good um otos awesome sounds great i'm gonna watch this movie tonight uh nice. link Kindler will definitely check this out thanks for putting it on my radar and a uh, question here where will monstrous be available to watch and when will it be out on physical media says Cavatino Cavalryman Shea. It's out now, right? On v- video on demand. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. All the usual suspects, you know, like iTunes. I don't even know if it's called iTunes anymore, but mm-hmm. Amazon, uh, all, you know, in direct TV, all wherever you like rent video on demand. And then there actually is a Blu-ray release coming out in July. Um, and I imagine also probably around that time, it'll probably go to um, a streamer as well for people who wait um, for those. I don't know uh, which one, but I, I think that would probably be the timing for that. Great. Well, Chris uh, Sievertson, thank you so much for joining us on the Film Threat Livecast. Uh, our chat loves you, and I'm they're happy to have discovered the movie. And uh, congrats again. And thanks for thanks for the shout out for my book at the beginning. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. yeah. Well, thanks for writing it. It was seriously a, a huge help to me. Oh, that's um, and great. thanks for having me. It's uh, this was this was awesome. Yeah, cool. And I hope uh, your next film come back. Don't forget us. I won't. I won't. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care, Chris. Have a great day. All right. All right. Later. Thanks, guys. Bye. You too.